Good evening from Greece, but also good morning and uh, good afternoon since uh, we have um, speakers and attendees in different uh, time zones. Uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome you all to this uh, virtual roundtable on the geopolitics of higher education. My name is Yanis Mantzoukas. I'm the executive director of the Global University Hub uh, here at the Metropolitan College of Greece. Metropolitan College is a leading higher education institution in Greece and the largest uh, transnational education provider by enrollment in Europe. The Global University Hub is the region's largest university hub, home to key uh, global universities offering diverse academic and uh, uh, professional programs. Because of the global nature of the hub, there's no better platform and no better time than now to explore how international higher education practices are being shaped by the shifting political dynamics at the global level. To discuss this topic today, I'm going to introduce you a great lineup of speakers, six highly experienced and knowledgeable experts in the field who will give their views and reflections on this topic. Before I go further with introduction, I just thought I'd share a few thoughts on the topic because I find it very interesting myself. Geopolitical shifts during the late 20th century triggered a remarkable pace of internationalization. Above all, internationalization brought into being a new phenomenon in history, interconnection. Nowadays, we live in a highly interconnected world where technological advances allow us to, to share information across borders, cultures, and linguistic barriers like never before in human history. Of course, to do business as well. So this long wave of uh, internationalization has also sustained a tremendous global growth in the scale and scope of higher education. The higher education sector operates in a fast changing, globally interconnected world in which most of the universities are all international in orientation, with well uh, developed global webs of interaction that help them to create, disseminate and apply knowledge and do business as well as I said. So globalization brought new opportunities and new challenges for graduates and academics seeking to prosper in and contribute to an increasingly interdependent world. It's also brought big new markets and novel business models for providers of higher education. So most of us in the higher education sector work on the basis that globalization is set to continue. However, as the 21st century progresses, a new series of geopolitical shifts has emerged. These are characterized by weaknesses in global governance, growing political populism, nationalism, and authoritarianism, the shrinking balance of power towards Asia, climate-related emergencies, and the growing demands for reparative social justice. The dynamics that come into play which directly impacting on international higher education can be visualized in the following four cases. The Russia-Ukraine conflict, the post-Brexit Britain, the Asian century, as it's widely referred now, and the geopolitics and knowledge diplomacy in Southeast Mediterranean, Middle East, and Africa. So those are just some initial thoughts that this topic simulates for me, but as I said, uh, we have a great line of speakers who will give their views and reflections on neo-geopolitics of international higher education. So joining us today is Jenny Lee, professor at the Department of Education Policy Studies and Practice at the University of Arizona. Jenny is currently joining us from Tucson. Welcome, Jenny. Jason says, co-president of IIE, the Institute of International Education in the US, uh, Jason is joining us from Washington, D.C. Uh, Moritz van Hoyen, Professor and Director of the University of Europe for Applied Sciences in Germany, Chief Academic Officer of uh, Global University Systems, and uh, former President of Compostela Group of Global Universities. Jo uh, Moritz is going to join us in a few seconds uh, from Germany. Um, we have here with us Mohamed Rosdi, Professor and former Rector at the University of Réunion, He's currently at ASSE for University and Scientific Operation in the Embassy of France in Greece. Mohamed is here with us in Athens. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Vivian Stern, Director of Universities UK International. 
Vivian is based in London, but today we are very happy for having him here in Athens. And uh, last but not least, Professor Dinos Arkoumanis, former Vice President of City, University of London, and Chairman of Metropolitan College Academic Board. Thank you all for joining us today. So, uh, once we're ready, uh, let's uh, uh, kick things off. Uh, when I was uh, doing this uh, initial research for this topic, I found an article about the Russian Union of Rectors. This is a group uh, representing more than 700 higher education executives, which offered its full support and endorsement of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. The, interestingly, next to these, there was another article about a number of governments around the world, including the UK, Canada, and Ireland, that have all eased visa requirements for Ukrainians and offering them sponsorship for studies abroad. And this brings us to the first question, how the Russia Ukraine war is changing the international higher education geopolitics. I would like to start with, uh, with Jason. Jason, may we have your views on this? Professor Kumanis, please feel to, to, com to contribute as well. Jason. Great. Thank you. I, I think number one, uh, all universities need to have a foreign policy and how they're going to, to react to geopolitical events and what their role will be uh, participating in them. I could say for at least for IIE, we've reacted by uh, issuing emergency grants uh, to over 200 Ukrainian students studying in the United States. It's essentially a bridge grant so that they have an, enough funds for housing, uh, tuition, books, et cetera, uh, for, for a short period as, of course, it's difficult for them to receive funds from uh, their family back in Ukraine. Uh, so that's one thing. And then uh, we have a few other programs that we're doing. Uh, we have our scholar rescue program uh, that we will most likely receive applications from scholars from the region and work with universities around the world to place those scholars uh, at their university. We have a very similar program for artists that we call the Artist Protection Fund to find placements for artists around the world, uh, both at higher education institutes and other uh, institutes. And then lastly, we have our Odyssey Scholarship, where we provide uh, essentially full ride grants uh, to displaced and refugee students uh, for them to pursue their bachelor's or master's at universities around the world. So all these things combined and, and what other organizations are doing uh, will, will help uh, with the situation uh, and, and the war in Ukraine. Interesting. Uh, Professor Kmanis? Carry on. Uh, and it's, uh, it's very nice to hear the, the supportive measures that yep. Jason uh, highlighted about uh, the Ukrainian students. But just to put things into perspective, this uh, uh, Russia-Ukrainian war follows uh, two years of the pandemic that has influenced the lives of everybody around the world. The war as it stands now has a more restricted impact in some way, with Europe more affected. But we started seeing the stream of refugees from Ukraine. These uh, young people may not have the financial resources to study as they used to do, and therefore offers like that of Jason and today I was uh, reading about uh, my uh, institution, the Royal Academy of Engineering, offering support to researchers from Ukraine. But uh, we need to see also the Russian side. And uh, uh, Russian students um, were uh, coming uh, in large numbers in uh, the UK and in the US. Uh, these students will find an unfriendly atmosphere waiting for them. And therefore, we are going to see very reduced numbers. Also, Ukraine students going to Russia, that would be clearly a major problem. And, and it's interesting that the last few years have seen partnerships uh, between uh, European universities and uh, universities in Russia. Uh, which is a huge uh, place 
uh, all these partnerships we now have to be reconsidered. So uh, uh, that uh, war is now bringing an energy crisis. And that's an area that we need to consider. Uh, one impact is that uh, many students will probably be attracted by the way the European Union will try to disengage from the energy dependence from Russia through alternative sources of energy and other studies. So this area of studies will be very popular, I expect. Second, in times of financial crisis, there is evidence that the undergraduate programs suffer and there are more postgraduate programs because they last for one year. It's a short period of time and students expect that in a year's time or in two years time, everything will be back to normal. So they may see investing in more in postgraduate studies. So um, issues like climate change are going to be seen in a different way for the next year or so. Uh, there will be a kind of um, pausing uh, of uh, uh, the issues with natural gas, because natural gas will be very much in demand. <laughs> but in a year's time, we hope to see uh, a little bit uh, back to, to normalization with uh, gas and oil coming from the Eastern Mediterranean, maybe reaching Europe. But this is a topic that we are going to cover later yes. in yeah. the yeah. Uh, seminar. Yeah, uh, that's, yeah that's, that's very interesting. And um, uh, I'm, we're, I'm, I'm happy for having uh, um, Professor Moritz van Hoyen with us. Um, welcome. Um, Moritz, we, we were discussing about um, how the Russia-Ukraine war is changing the international higher education geopolitics. And I was wondering if you if you want to contribute on this. May... Yes, sure. Thank you. I'm not sure. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. I mean, we had some technical problems, I think, to, for me to get into your, uh, your meeting. So I, I, uh, I hope that uh, Dinos gave my answer already. Uh, I, I certainly heard the last part and I uh, could not disagree with anything he said. But, uh, uh, so thank you very much um, and great to be back in, in Athens, albeit uh, virtually, and, and I clearly made the wrong decision. I should have come in person given the awful weather we're having at the moment in Berlin. Uh, so, um, you know, one of those, those errors one makes in life, right? But uh, <coughs> seriously, seriously, um, look. It's, it's obviously really awful what's happening in Ukraine. And I was standing uh, only yesterday at the station in, in, in Berlin taking another train. And you see the huge trains coming in from, from Warsaw, uh, full with uh, uh, refugees uh, from the Ukraine, all just with one or two suitcases. And you know you see thousands of, of people streaming out of that train and it's just one train after another. And you suddenly see that these are not just headlines. This is not just news on television. It's actually happening in front of you. And you just cannot imagine that something like this is happening in Europe. I just could not have imagined it. And, you know, and, and obviously here in Germany, but also in the Netherlands, so everybody is, is really uh, shocked and, and passionate and, and helping with packing goods for and, and making accommodation available and so on on big scale. And that's the heartwarming part of it. The taking a little bit, you know, the emotion out of it and, and, and looking at it more from an academic perspective and a bit more rational. Um, the, the truth is that uh, when it comes to these kind of events and when it comes to geopolitics, um, this is what happens, except we do not happen, we expect it to happen anymore on our doorstep. There is an, 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 a philosophy, as you all know, about globalization that we become so intertwined and our economy is so interconnected uh, that no country really can go to war anymore, ultimately, because it hurts them in a big way as much as it hurts uh, the neighbor. And, and of course, this is hurting Russia and it's hurting uh, Europe a little bit now and it will hurt Europe more in the future. And yes, in that sense, interconnectivity of economies is happening. But somehow, it doesn't prevent a yes. country from going to a war. And that is, of course, the, the real shocking experience uh, here. 
you know, we, we have the, the famous known and uh, known unknowns and unknown unknowns uh, as as we were introduced under the, the the war in in the in the Middle East when with the uh, Iraqi war uh, was was uh, happening in the early 90s, and of course, the known unknown is yes, war will happen. Yeah. Uh, even though everybody is passionate about peace, there's one certainty in the in the known unknowns: war will happen. And I might even go as far as saying that large powers, whether it's Russia, whether it's China, whether it's US and so on, are quite likely to be involved in wars at some time. Um, so that's not the surprising part. What is really uh, uh, shocking and, and, and I think it's so emotional is the fact that the unknown unknown was that a war like this can happen in Europe. Uh, and, and this is something which we felt was uh, beyond uh, the, the likelihood. Now, of course, when it comes to, to uh, what does that mean for higher education, there's a certain amount of, of uh, risk management always going uh, uh, taking place in, in international education, and that is the, the classic, the likelihood something happens versus the impact something has, and, and we make these assessments in all our international work. So the likelihood that this could happen was probably moderate. Uh, the impact is potentially very, very high, and that's what also is, is causing a, a bigger shock than we would normally expect to see when uh, countries go to um, to war. Now, when it comes to the complexity of higher education, I think there is, you know, the, the the real complexity here is that the Russian university presidents publicly have supported uh, the war. Uh, of course, also the Orthodox Church and so on. Don't get wrong; it's not just the, the the universities, but and 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 it is not difficult to imagine why that happened. I don't think there was much alternative to do that. But of course, it does make it much more difficult for uh, institutions uh, outside Russia uh, to ignore that. So, uh, you know, it is actually quite uncommon for a university to condone or even support uh, war. Normally, uh, you would, in principle, be against it, even if you might think that it is for justified reasons. As, as Dino said, we get, can look at the Russian side as well. But even then, you would normally, as a university, not do that. And in 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 a more natural reaction is actually you would not just come, you know you would just not just ignore it but you would actually say we are actually directly against it or at the very least you would not support it. Uh, so that is a complexity we we are seeing in this here because now for us as universities outside Russia, uh, how do we react to that? Because we obviously could not condone military action, whoever that would uh, take, whether it's US, whether it's China, whether it's Russia, or, or any other country. We would just not uh, easily do that. So that's a complicated. Now, the, the final point, though, is, is a, I always want to uh, finish with an optimistic point. And that is, of course, uh, you know, we all hope that, you know, that will be an outcome to this war uh, and, and, and an acceptable outcome. But at a certain moment, wars, they do not last forever. And, uh, and, and the Main thing when it comes to restoring some level of normality at some stage, difficult to imagine maybe now, but, but you know, this is the, the inevitable outcome of, of history, right? So where there will be some level of normality again, um, um, we must be sure unless someone really starts pushing the wrong buttons, is uh, that um, academic diplomacy is normally the first step on the road to, to repairing and healing wounds. It's true. And uh, and that's really what you see happening uh, in the past. I mean, when you know, let's say the relationship China Taiwan, actually at university level, the relationship stayed relatively normal, and they were the first also then to build the bridges and so on. And that's what you see in many situations like this: that the universities are the first ones who apply what we call the academic diplomacy, and we start rebuilding the bridges. And and I, I sincerely hope that that's moment will come sooner rather than later. At the moment, I must admit, it doesn't really look that good. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. And I like the, the, the comments or the description about the, the complexity because that one leads very well, um, links very well with the next question, which is about uh, Brexit. So universities offering transnational education outside their country face a growing range of legal, practical and 
political challenges. So the disruption coming from the COVID-19 pandemic and the Brexit has further amplified many of these challenges, raising questions about what the future might hold for international and transnational education in response to Brexit and the shifting territorial politics. And I was wondering if we could have uh, Vivian's perspective on this. Yes, well, thank you. I mean, Brexit has been a real challenge for UK universities. There's absolutely no question about that. And there's an awful lot of unfinished business, as you described, particularly around the, uh, the regulatory uh, and recognition landscape. Uh, I'm extremely concerned about the basis on which uh, universities in the UK and uh, around Europe can continue to collaborate in research and in relation to the exchange of students. Um, but if you take both Brexit and COVID together, um, I'm an optimist, naturally, and I think you have to look at the way that universities have responded to the hurdles that have been put in their way and uh, and done things differently. You know, the, there is a, a very strong growth in the provision of UK higher education outside the UK, including through partnerships such as the one that many universities in the UK have with, um, uh, with uh, partners in Greece and Metropolitan College foremost amongst them. Um, the pandemic also um, catalyzed a, a rapid growth in the provision of um, distance, um, fully online uh, higher education. And I think possibly also changed attitudes to that. And in the long run, I think there's going to be an which emerges from some of this, although the short term certainly creates challenges, which is that if your primary interest is in expanding access to high quality education, we know that the, the proportion of people who can travel outside their home country to pursue higher education is always going to be limited. Typically, it's about 2% of the higher education population worldwide will seek degrees outside their home country. And that's been pretty stable, notwithstanding the growth in the proportion of, um, of individuals enrolled in higher education um, in total. Um, so if you really want to expand uh, your reach and reach a larger uh, proportion of the higher education population, you have to take your offer to those students where they are. And I think that is one of the things that Brexit and the COVID pandemic have accelerated. UK universities have been pretty entrepreneurial in that regard. They've got a strong track record of um, providing transnational education. And it's now pretty mainstream um, with the majority of UK universities involved in some way or another. So, I mean, you know, the optimist in me says, uh, you just deal with the short term barriers and you take advantage of the catalytic effect that uh, these sorts of big changes have uh, and you innovate. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Vivian. Professor Manis? Just to add that uh, the challenge that uh, institutions like Metropolitan College uh, uh, of having partnership with British institutions, the challenge that Brexit has brought in, uh, represents also an opportunity for European institutions especially around Central Europe, to develop English-speaking programs. And we see an exponential increase of those programs in a number of countries in Europe in order to attract students that may uh, decide not to go to the UK because the fees are high or uh, for any uh, other reason. So we see a rebalancing. Yeah. Uh, that is going to take place in, in Europe. But of course, I agree with Vivian and I can support it after 42 years in the UK that the British institution, the British educational system will remain uh, top um, with the US as well, uh, uh, contemplating and, and uh, complementing each other in many ways. Uh, so there, there will be ways to balance the damage that Brexit. I like the comments about the prestigious universities in, in the US, uh, in Europe, in the UK. And um, because that one links very well with the next one about the Asian universities. And um, the performance of Chinese research universities has been Im improving quickly according to the major global university rankings, which is to a large extent, uh, the results of uh, 
various national excellence initiatives that uh, China, for example, um, uh, exploits. So the latest of these, the Double World Class Project, the Asian Universities Alliance, and the China's Research Evaluation Reform, I'm sure that and will have important implications for higher education you know, across the, the globe. So what's the impact of China's higher education excellence initiatives on international higher education? Are these a real threat to status quo, Jenny, for example? May we have your views on this? Sure, thank you for the question. Um, so as Ian has mentioned, there are some, China's doing a lot right now, and among those is, of course, the strive to have a higher proportion of world-class universities, regional agreements, but also a movement away from what they refer to as SCI worship and a focus more on domestic journals and written in Chinese. And these are seemingly different strands, one towards internationalization, the other towards domestic priorities, local criteria, and, and how China will successfully accomplish all of these at the same time without compromising the others, a bit unclear. But especially this is because of the the criteria by which we determine world class. And so regardless of these particular initiatives, and I anticipate more to come, we are seeing ambitious goals to change the status quo. And the status quo is not the goal really for anyone except those who are in the most dominant positions, uh, really benefiting the US, UK, as measured by rankings and world class universities. So maybe to some of the countries that we represent, this is um, a threat, but really this is a, a change, potential change in, in global positioning or attempts to shift that status quo. And as countries develop their infrastructure, research capacity, they are in a position like China to better challenge rather than support the global order. Um, I think it's important to note, though, what is the goal? Like, do we want to maintain the status quo? Do, do things need to change? Are they threats or are they opportunities? I think it really depends on the, the place that we're coming from, the national agendas. But also to note that, again, war is not forever, nor are rankings forever, nor are dominant countries forever, as we've learned through history. So really, I think it's um, a matter of what we view as a threat, uh, what are the interests, because national agendas, global interests do not always align. And especially when it comes to knowledge production, there's longstanding debates about what constitutes knowledge, who has access to knowledge, who produces knowledge, how is it legitimized. And now national agendas are playing central roles in shaping that. So here we're seeing the case of China um, having more say in given their tremendous scientific output, their ability to change existing norms away from English-based journals and Western criteria. So yes, definitely look out for China, but as we'll get into the next questions, you know, how real of a threat is this? Uh, we have, we'll, we'll talk more about. Yeah, Moritz? Or Jason, may we have your views on this? Sure, I, I would say in relation to China, um, it, it's a it's a really good story. You know, over the past twenty years, uh, China wasn't uh, in the in the top ten host destination uh, rankings, but but now it's uh, number four. Likewise, a, another fact to, to celebrate in the higher ed community is that over that twenty year period, the pie has gotten much larger. That we've gone from our student mobility data shows from one point six. Uh, million students to 5.6 million. So uh, the whole landscape is changing. And I think your next question, Ianis, we can we can go into that even further. Yeah, yeah. Moritz, may we have your views on this? Yes, I mean, I'm, I'm you know, China's a success story. Uh, I can remember going to China uh, from the mid 90s onwards when I was asked by by you know my colleagues, university presidents, and so on, why are you here? Right, with you know what. Uh, they couldn't actually understand why someone who then represented a British university would spend time in, in China. And I, my uh, simple answer then was I want to be part of a success story. And I could see the success story then. And, you know, it has been an, an, a success beyond imagination. I mean, I couldn't even see that it would be such a dramatic shift. Uh, so it's very impressive, by the way, not only China, we're focusing on China now, but it could also have given the example of, let's say, South Korea which is also uh, not only a, a success story in, in terms of higher education, but also the impact 
of the investment in higher education on the economic situation in, in South Korea is, is seriously impressive. Um, so it, it, it's heartwarming to see uh, what a government can do by investing in their education infrastructure and how huge impact it can have, not just in terms of status and reputation, but also on the, on the social and economic conditions of that country. Of course, the, the point of the question is, uh, and it's, it's pointed out already by, by Jenny and Jason, is, is there is no such thing as status quo. I mean, yes, status quo <laughs> in the sense of, well, that is what it is at the moment. But of course, there's only one thing for sure about the status quo, and it is not a, a status quo. It will change by definition, and that's good. It's not a threat. It is actually healthy. Competition is not necessarily, on the contrary, if there wouldn't be competition, uh, actually, we would all stand still. And so what we now see is the status quo, actually, when you go step, a couple of steps back, and I was talking about the 1990s, look, the UK, uh, international activities of the UK uh, in the 1980s were still quasi-charitable. It was only Margaret Thatcher who introduced fees for international students, which suddenly gave a massive incentive uh, for universities uh, to go into the international market, and of course also on the other side, she cut the cost, the, the, the revenue for universities such a dramatic way that, you know, they, they, there was a bit of a pull and push uh, with, which gave almost no uh, alternative then to go into the international market. Not that she uh, had planned that or expected that, but that was the, 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 the impact of it. So the UK actually only entered the, the, the market, the international market, only in the 1990s. And I can remember when I moved to the UK in 1993, and actually one of my first trips was to Australia to see how the Australians were doing it because the Australians then were actually in many ways sharper when it came to the international marketing, et cetera, than the UK. Uh, but also the UK, uh, the Australia was, was really not there uh, before the 1990s. It's only government initiatives which made a big difference uh, in, in the 1990s to stimulate universities to start thinking about recruiting international students and so on. So it is an, 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 uh, a normal aspect of life that, uh, you know, the, the market develops, new countries come in, and when we call it this, a, a, a threat, I would not call it a threat, I think competition is healthy, but it's also uh, something we, we have to bear in mind uh, that uh, um, you know, it keeps us on our toes, and there is something which worries me, by the way. Uh, so you could say, okay, that's all great. No, there is something else which worries me, and that's the opposite side, and that is protectionism. Uh, so, um, if, if it was really a free market and there would be these kind of movements and so on, that in itself was, was really not that bad. But we also see an, 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 an upcoming uh, nationalism, so universities are defined really as national institutions and international is defined as serving the national interest, uh, which is actually not necessarily how we at universities would look at it. We see universities as international operations, operation, you know, institutions which don't necessarily serve a national interest, but they serve a global interest maybe and want to produce global citizens. So nationalism is actually something which, which uh, is, is a worrying trend uh, because it's growing. Uh, protectionism, explicit or implicit, uh, most countries have a clear protectionistic approach, um, even though they might not want to admit it, it is what its reality is. And, why is that there? Yes, that is because they want to maintain the great status quo in their domestic system. They want to maybe protect public universities or they want to protect universities in their country full stop against foreign competition. But of course, by, by doing that, what they really do is, is protect vested interests. I think, Jason, you used that word. Uh, uh, it, it is clear that um, it is a threat if you accept there are vested interests which need to be protected. And, and that's something which, which does worry me. So again, as in the previous question, I answer, I finish on a positive note. <laughs> and my positive notes are, um, first of all, uh, my own organization, a, a global university systems, actually approaches the completely the other way around. So we start not with a national university, but we start with a global thinking, which has universities in different countries. So in other words, for us, there's never a national threat because we are all over the world and we will be there where it is so at the moment not in China because China is actually still a very protected market uh, but uh, you know we could be there in the future we would no doubt will be there so we have a really global approach rather than a national approach with an internationalization the other point which was quite rightly made uh, also uh, for the previous question is yes at the moment we have the steady two percent student mobility 
we can increase that. So the, actually the pie can grow and will grow. So it, there is also more room for more uh, uh, competitors, to put it that way. It's not that the pie is, is a steady pie. And the other way, the final point I want to make, the other way to grow that pie is also rethinking exactly what students are. Are they really school leavers? Are they just people with a bachelor's? Or actually, there's a huge, huge demand and need in the 21st century, uh, which is so dependent on globalization, digitization, and continuous reskilling, et cetera, uh, for also people that in other age groups to come and study. So the pie can grow as well, which also alleviates some of the perceived threats to, to our, our own uh, position. Yeah. Uh, if I'm not wrong, I think that the, 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 the Greek student mobility is close to 5%, which is significantly higher than the 2% you know, that uh, Vivian mentioned earlier. And um, uh, yes, it's true that there, there are plenty of neo-geopolitical challenges that we have to deal. And the question is how the, how the current system, how the, the Anglo-Saxon model of higher education organized around the, the big four, the, the US, the UK, Australia, and Canada will be able to resist these, uh, these challenges, these neo-geopolitical challenges. And I would like to hear Jason's uh, views on this. Sure, well, well, one, I hope we don't resist. I, I, again, uh, as the professor said, uh, there, there is room for additional mobility. We believe that given the pandemic, there's uh, a huge pent up demand uh, for more uh, mobility. And in terms of the big four, again, placing it in our data, um, they, they still uh, comprise the top five uh, destination uh, uh, countries uh, for students. So, so that's another important factor to keep in mind, China being uh, number four in Australia in, in the fifth spot. But I think we all need to recognize the tremendous amount of resources that countries around the world are putting into higher ed. Um, that's not only that's true for facilities and, and physical infrastructure. It's true for uh, recruiting the best faculty and students that they possibly can into their country. But there's also another aspect that's really important. And that is when I meet with universities around the world outside of the big four, there is a keen understanding of the benefits of internationalization for their campus, that it contributes tremendously to the vibrancy of the student experience, to the faculty, to the teaching, the research. And so um, this, is, this is absolutely fantastic that universities around the world now recognize the importance of having students from all around the world. And likewise, I would say for the, for the big four, um, almost every university that I meet with around the world wants some type of partnership with a university in the UK or the US or Canada. And so I don't see that diminishing. Uh, and, and I think the university university partnerships are extremely important. Yeah. Uh, Vivian, may we have your views? So, I mean, first of all, I strongly agree with two things that uh, Moritz said. First is that, I mean, I, I'm paraphrasing, but competition's good for us. Um, actually, you know, we, we thrive on competition. I think that it, it's competition that drives people to do better tomorrow than they did yesterday, and I think that's very important. Um, the, the second thing to say is that um, I don't think the mindset should be how do we push back, how do we prevent this shift? The shift will happen whether we, uh, we whatever we do. I think the, the smart thing to do is to, is to flow with it. And uh, we've talked about the rise of China and uh, other Asian uh, higher education systems. So South Korea, as we mentioned, but Singapore is a very, very significant example over a longer period of a system that has become uh, really preeminent. I mean, really outstanding institutions. It's imperative that the best universities in the UK form partnerships, develop relationships, collaborate in research, exchange students, learn from each other with those great systems. Um, but it's also really important that we, we um, adapt to what students need and want. And one of the ways that we will do that is by um, working with the grain of uh, shifting student demand. I think the, the comment about the increasing proportion of, um, of individuals who look to partake of some form of higher education um, 
long after they first graduated, I think is a very important one. We need to adapt to that and meet that demand where it is. I think that the shift to um, to online and, and um, blended delivery is very important in that regard because for people who are time poor, traveling, basing yourself in, in the institution where you want to study might be simply impossible. Uh, but you know, models of delivery such as blended and online open that uh, possibility up. And the second is understanding the um, the shifts uh, towards intra-regional mobility. So the past has been largely characterized by inter-regional mobility. So people moving from one part of the world to another continent, perhaps the UK, the US, Australia. If you look at patterns of student mobility, what we're seeing is a growth in uh, in in patterns of student demand, which uh, lead individuals to go somewhere in their own region to study. So the rise of the hubs, and that's something that I think we should respond to. So instead of standing, you know, in our little island, in the case of the UK, lamenting the fact that the world's changing around us, we have to respond to how the world is changing around us. Go with it, uh, and that's what will make us stronger. Yeah, thank you, Jenny. May we have your views on this? Sure. I have a slightly. I agree, and I have another slightly way of thinking about the question is. I mean, clearly the Anglo-Saxon model is powerful, it's unlikely to be toppled anytime soon, to, even despite wars and geopolitical conflicts. It's perpetuated and so embedded in our system, in global rankings, accreditation, English as the global lingua franca, you know, who are the dominant hosts of international education? What does internationalization look like? Even the quality and nature of partnerships, who funds, who calls the shots, who benefits? I mean, these are very much in the interests of uh, these so-called big four countries. So although it's, you know, we can talk about the role of the nation states and who will stay in power and more, very likely will, but it's also a common cultural norm that is very persistent. And so I'm, I'm a realist. Um, I do not foresee that the big four will be able to, will be threatened in any way with these geopolitical challenges um, because the very top higher education institutions and the ways that we determine excellence will have to be overturned. That is simply not likely. Um, but at the same time, you know, when we talk about nation states and countries, and absolutely with the rise of populism and nationalism, there are also movements within these countries to challenge these Anglo-Saxon model systems and values that determine who is world-class or which countries are on top. And there are greater questions about how we can decolonize education, how do we consider more diverse knowledges, what different forms it'll take. Um, there are critical scholars of higher education, especially in these countries that have criticized Western dominance, um, sometimes referring it to it as white supremacy or whiteness. So we shouldn't assume that these views are uniform within nation states or that there is a common goal of putting uh, the, the national priorities before other values, the diversity within countries. And so these challenges will grow, but in the end, but, and the challenges can come within countries. I mean, we're seeing that in Russia even. Um, but again, going back to the original question, the dominant Anglo-Saxon model is so powerful that I, I do believe that uh, it will continue and, and despite the things that we're seeing in the world. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Mohamed, what about France? I know that there are many changes in the French higher education system recently. Where does France stand? Yeah, this is a, a large question. Uh, uh, just a few minutes, please. Yeah, yeah, I, okay. I want to go back uh, 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 talking about the what happened uh, in, in Russia and Ukraine and uh, what uh, the European Union is doing is uh, something very strong really very huge hosting of course these uh, Ukrainian students giving uh, facilities scholarships housing and so on but uh, also the uh, the European Union uh, stopped the cooperation the collaborations with the uh, the Russian institutions but they didn't I mean stop uh, hosting Russians researchers, and students. That's the something I mean very important. Uh, be, I mean uh, related to what uh, Jenny said, 
we still have to keep the relations, the, the collaborations to open the mind of, uh, of let's say, this, this population, Russian and so on, in many other countries. And this goes also a lot through higher education. We have that, I mean, that, that uh, goal, that mission to, uh, to uh, still uh, do uh, there. G going back now to your question, where, where France is standing in the, what's happening in higher education in, in the world and in Europe. Uh, France um, is, uh, of course, uh, doing, I mean, something very, uh, very strong uh, is um, to push to collaboration inside the EU. What was created now three years ago, the go that what we call the, the European universities. Emmanuel Macron uh, pushed, uh, pushed that uh, that time in a project through the European Commission to create. Uh, let's uh, consortia of uh, uh, European universities all around the uh, the European countries, some like like chain of universities where students can move from a university to another one in the same consortium. I mean, very freely, much more than the Erasmus uh, program. This is something very, very strong. The, the goal is, of course, higher education, uh, enhancing research, but uh, the, the, the main goal was, I mean, a social and political goal to, uh, to fight populism to fight nationalism. That was, I mean, the main goal to create these, uh, these uh, uh, consortia. Uh, today, we have in Europe 41 consortia uh, like those, and others are getting maybe, uh, uh, I mean, selected in the few uh, next uh, weeks. This is what uh, is uh, pushed by, by France. France, of course, also is uh, pushing uh, its uh, uh, own uh, higher education system. Um, what uh, was uh, said at the beginning of this, uh, of this um, webinar was the fact that uh, the, the English language will, in France also we understood uh, years ago now that of course we are defending our, uh, our language, of course, uh, the French one and the Francophonie, but we, uh, the French universities are creating more and more degrees most of them master degrees and PhD programs in English. Uh, for the, uh, till this year, we have 107,000 uh, programs, uh, master degrees and uh, PhD programs in, uh, in English. And uh, la last point I wanted to, uh, to point out is the, uh, from my point of view, there is, as uh, my colleagues say, there's no risks. I think for higher education because somehow higher education is above all these uh, some I mean political pro, uh, pro, uh, problems uh, issues with uh, uh, between countries uh, youth and young people are moving all around the world they don't care about what's happening there and there of course they don't go in uh, countries I mean uh, where there is uh, uh, no less uh, freedom and but go to United States, Canada, Australia, France, all the European countries, they move, they don't care about this. So this is something very, I mean, very strong. What is something uh, interesting to, I mean, to push in the more and more is the, this, the, the, the exchange pro uh, programs between higher education establishments. This is something very interesting uh, between, I mean, the, the universities and high school colleges to uh, give the possibilities to students to move from, uh, for in exchange programs a semester, a year. This is something uh, we are also uh, developing a lot in France with uh, the other countries. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you, Mohamed. And this brings us to, to the last question. Um, I know that we're running a little of time. Um, universities in Turkey st are struggling to balance the demand from thousands of Syrian and African refugees for higher education with strong competition among domestic students. So it seems that Turkey, for example, the United Arab Emirates, Egypt and Israel are getting close again. So the pandemic was um, a wake up call for these countries to reduce tensions, accelerate cooperation 
and increase economic integration for mutual benefit. So it seems that there is an agenda for, for higher education as well. So what's the place of the Arab Muslim world in the neo-geopolitics of higher education? Is there any relationship between East-West dynamic and North-South dynamic? And uh, what is it? Jason, may we have your views on this? Sure. Thank you, Yanis. So I, over the past eight weeks, I've made two trips to the MENA region, and I've been astounded by how much uh, they're putting forward in terms of resources for physical infrastructure, for faculty, for students. And I would say, uh, in particular, for instance, Saudi Arabia is, is going through a major change and right. they're coming to uh, uh, have co-ed faculty, uh, have uh, co-ed instruction, uh, reach parity between uh, male and female students. So it, it's really amazing what's happening in the region. Um, also in Abu Dhabi, uh, the partnerships with uh, the United States are very strong. NYU Abu Dhabi, for instance, uh, they over uh, the past couple of years, they created the MBZ University for artificial intelligence. Uh, Egypt, for instance, has uh, recently built four new universities. I believe they want to build over a dozen universities. So there's a tremendous amount going on in the region. And they're, they're, they're hungry for partnerships with universities around the world. They, they view that as a key aspect of their policies and procedures as, as they modernize uh, their, their higher education uh, system. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Mohammed? Um, I fully agree. Something, um, something is happening there, yeah. really. For higher education, something is uh, getting structured uh, better and better in those countries, uh, specifically in uh, Saudi Arabia. Um, I mean, they are attracting lots of foreign students from Africa and from the, 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 this area. And I think that the... Um, this is the place for the transnational education. Something has to be more, is already done, of course. There are many, a uh, lot of, uh, I mean, uh, many um, foreign universities, Americans from UK there. And this is, I think, the opportunity now, since this place maybe is getting somehow more steady, more stable, to get there, to develop more, I mean, uh, um, cooperation, more collaborations, and to implement their degrees and uh, research programs with those countries. Yeah, yeah. Yanis, I, I do have one thing to add and to add on what to what Mohammed just said. I do have one concern for the region, and that is there is certainly a recognition of the importance of STEM fields but maybe not quite as much for the humanities and the arts. And, and I don't think the MENA region is unique in that, in that regard, but I do think it is responsible for all of us in, in higher education leadership to recognize the importance of the humanities and the arts alongside STEM fields. Yeah, yeah. Fully, fully agree. Yeah, fully agree. Uh, me too. Jenny? Um, it's, it's I know we're running out of time. It's complicated. It's really difficult to talk about this region as, as homogeneous or a single singular approach. Um, I think in addition to uh, what the panelists mentioned is, you know, there's also some leeriness about culture. And I think that also, you know, we talk about political relationships, geopolitical, but there's also the underlying culture. And I think that sometimes as we've seen in other partnerships, there may be resistance because of maybe limitations on academic freedom, gender, human rights, and so on. And, and not just focused on this region, but I think generally that is something that will continue, that institutions will continue need, needing to grapple with, even if there's interests on both parties, the form that it takes and the participation will may vary. So just something for us to continue thinking about. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Johnny. Uh, I know that we're running out of time. Um, so we have a few, just to spend a few minutes for closing uh, comments. Uh, feel free to, to share a reflection to, or a particular hope or concern. Professor yeah, Argumanis. Yeah. I think we need to, since the, the topic today, geopolitics and the impact on educational trends and so on, uh, let's uh, look at the war, uh, the Russian-Ukrainian war. What is causing is an energy crisis. Yeah. And the energy crisis uh, is doing two positive things. 
bringing the countries of the EU closer together, strengthening the EU, but it, very interestingly is strengthening the partnership between the countries around the Eastern Mediterranean. Mm. Let me be more specific. Uh, the number of partnerships between the countries around the Mediterranean, Greece, Turkey, Cyprus, Israel, Egypt, uh, are, uh, have uh, intensified. And the reason this is happening is that the countries around the Mediterranean are expecting to replace a significant fraction of the oil and gas produced by Russia. The latest indication is that about 20% of the quantity, which is 150 BCM, uh, billions of uh, cubic meters of gas, can be produced by the countries in the Eastern Mediterranean. And that is going to encourage the flow of students, will strengthen the economy, in the countries and because of the bilateral uh, agreements that will do what Mohammed and, and Jenny and Jason mentioned of the increased flow of students creating really a, a educational hub around the Mediterranean and Greece since we are in Greece is expecting to lead in that uh, educational hub yeah, around the Mediterranean. Yeah, yeah. Vivian, just... So, I mean, I suppose my final reflection would be um, if we had had this discussion in the UK with the, the topic being geopolitics, we would have spent the majority of the time talking about how universities might expose themselves to or mitigate the risks associated with um, with our international collaborations. That's what the conversation would have been about. There is a very intense conversation happening in many of our countries about the extent to which universities are um, recognize and mitigate um, the potential uh, risks involved in collaboration and research, and particularly in areas which uh, have a potential dual use. Um, the uh, exposure of our systems to over-reliance on, uh, on income from uh, from China particularly um, and there would be a lot of nervousness uh, particularly in the light of the Russian invasion of Ukraine about what would happen if there was a hostility you know some sort of uh, open hostility uh, between China and uh, and the West and I think it's really quite remarkable that we haven't talked about that um, it it is a, a debate that I think we have to engage with because if we want to remain open and if we want to continue to have the political permission to engage in the kind of activities we've talked about today, we have to take seriously the concerns that some of our governments have about the risks that are involved. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Vivian. Mohammed? Um, uh, I wanted to, come, to go back to the, the, uh, what uh, Jason said about the humanities and uh, social sciences. I think uh, this is the uh, maybe the, the the point to um, uh, to enhance more not only in this area but in all our countries. During this last decade, we did a lot for science, technology, and maybe we forgot a bit about Iceberg, these yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. these aspects, yeah. these fields to develop more. Maybe to implement more in even in the scientific degrees more and more social sciences, more humanities. Uh, this is something I think missed uh, specifically in the, in the French system. Yeah. Uh, Maurice? Uh, um, let me first stress that I, I completely agree with, with Mohammed that that's an absolutely okay. well-made point uh, that we as a university have to be careful we don't go too far in specialization and forget actually how interconnected also the academic side is, not just the complex world, uh, but, but uh, we, we sometimes maybe in, in our desire to specialize and, and uh, we have oversimplified sometimes uh, in, you know the, the way we teach at, at universities of the world but wow there is, this is such a rich discussion and you know you, you want to react on everything and I, I know that that would not make me very popular because I'm going to take way too much time I, I just want to to maybe react to one or two points first of all how much I agree with, with Dinos uh, when he talks about how as part of the, the consequence of this this in some ways, weird war, 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 sorry, weird war, which was not supposed to happen because we are all so dependent on each other. Uh, actually, you see, 
yes, the globalization is, is affected by it. Well, wow, we, we have to be careful. We are not so dependent on each other because you do not know what Russia is going to do or what China is going to do or even the US is going to do under people like Trump and so on. But uh, at the same time, we also know that in, as, a, as a small nation, because most of us are small nations, we cannot actually cope on our own either. To, to deal with the threat. So there is an, a natural tendency then to start forming new alliances, and I'm, I'm not just talking about the formal alliances like the European Union and, and the NATO and so on, where we say we have to surround ourselves by trusted uh, friends and we have to sit down together and make sure we are really working together uh, on things like, like the sustainability of, of our food, our energy, but also in, in regard to higher education, because again, higher education is most of the time the, the Part which underpins that. So it, it is an interesting how, how in some ways the current uh, traumatic events uh, um, stimulate an, a regionalism uh, which actually can be quite beneficial and that will definitely also has an, a connection with uh, the, the hubs which will emerge in those regions and, and, and the MENA region was, was mentioned, I was actually speaking at the MENA conference in Dubai only um, whatever a good week ago and, and we were talking about hubs as well. Of course, a, a place like Dubai is extremely successful in, in having to create it itself, invented itself as a, as a major hub for higher education. Now, how did they do that? And, and the interesting thing is, of course, it's not Dubai, it's Dubai free zones. In other words, they created conditions of, of liberty, of freedom, taking it away from the constraints of, of high over-regulation, over interference and so on, which unfortunately is still so common in national systems. And I think that is an important lesson to learn for, for countries. I was saying, guys, in your desire to, to maybe maintain the status quo and, and, and protect vested interests and so on, you actually pay a heavy price by actually taking away too much uh, freedom. And, and by creating freedom, actually, you could also uh, become much more like a hub. And, and it's, it's, a, it's an important uh, discussion. And of course, it's interesting that uh, politically, it's a sensitive discussion, as, as we mentioned earlier. But economically, it's a pretty straightforward discussion. Of course, this is what has happened in Australia. This has happened in the UK as well. I mean, in the UK, you can immediately say, OK, how much does the UK economy earn from foreign students? Right? Answer is immediately available. Just Google it. I did it a moment ago. It is roughly 30, 35 billion euro. Right? That is, according to some, I mean, you know, economics can calculate this in a slightly different way. For every 10 students are, are, are at uh, the net impact in the UK economy is roughly 1 million. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, wow, I mean, there are clear political arguments to not, you know, create an, a, a regional connection. But there are also hard economic arguments, if you do not like the, economic, the political arguments, uh, to say, hey guys, this, this is actually a big opportunity and, and, and it's such frustration that some countries do not see this and other yeah. countries do and, and are able to benefit from it. Yeah. Jenny? Um, I have really enjoyed this kind of this conversation. I mean, undoubtedly, internationalization, the demand for it, for students, for partnerships, for research, transnational education, that will grow uh, inevitably. The shape that it will be taken will be based on the geopolitical conditions. And I appreciate, and I was you know, echoing what Vivian said earlier, is that this needs to be at the forefront of these conversations. And I think for many, outs at least in my circles, geopolitics is a distraction from a, a, a preset agenda. And I think that naive approach, it really undermines a lot of expensive ventures that don't produce the expectations because we're not having these conversations. So Giannis, I applaud you for organizing this. I, I learned a lot and I think it's, um, yeah, I'm optimistic, pessimistic. It, it's hard to tell, but I think that, you know, these these somewhat crises, right? These wars, the pandemic, the shifting of mobility and partnerships is forcing even those in the UK and US and Australia to even rethink our own strategies. And I think that's ultimately good. Um, transnational education will continue to explode and the different types and the creativity and the forms it takes. Um, we'll have another conversation about in the future and it may look very different. So uh, thank you all for the opportunity.
Thank you. Jason? Thank you, uh, Yanis. I, I'm glad to hear I have an ally in Mohammed with uh, the, talking about the importance of the humanities and the arts, and it, it may be a topic for a future panel. And likewise, I would say the 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 importance of international exchange as, as it relates to vocational training. Uh, we, we believe that will be a big area as we come out of the pandemic and, and continue to be another area that we should consider very strongly. Pivoting to the to the war in, in Ukraine, I would say we, 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 we shouldn't forget that we also have crises and 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 and, and wars in, in places like Yemen, uh, still problems related to Syria. Uh, not too long ago, there were crises in Ethiopia. And but I would say for all of that and for all of the countries represented here on the panel, it's, it's wonderful how our higher ed community is a safe haven for both scholars and students uh, as, as these ge geopolitical crises yeah. uh, seem to become more and more common. Um, so um, I think that's another important aspect for this panel to consider. And yeah. thank you again, Giannis, for, for organizing thank you. it. Thank you, Jason. And this is, this is a nice way to, to conclude the session. Um, this has been um, extremely informative and stimulating session. Um, I hope, I'm sure that we gave to the audience a flavor of what the issues are in the neo geopolitics of, uh, of higher education, international higher education, and to allow them to, to engage in the, in the global discussion. Uh, I believe that was very clear. I think the panel hit the core of the, of the issue. And, uh, as we have learned, uh, this is the beginning of, uh, of this conversation. Um, if, uh, uh, if you enjoyed the session, the recording uh, of this uh, will be available on our YouTube channel. In closing, on behalf of Metropolitan College and the Global University Hub, I would like to, to thank you all for your uh, significant contribution. For those who are abroad, um, don't forget that Greece is an all-year holiday destination. <laughs> okay. um, uh, Jenny, Jason, Moritz, feel free to to come and visit us metropolitan college will be delighted to host and uh, look after you and uh, for all those in greece keep enjoying the beautiful weather thank you very much indeed thank you thank for you. pointing that out yeah. very very much appreciated it's pouring here thank you, yes. <laughs> thank, you. thank you bye